another esoteric video on a subject that can't but be approached esoterically, if you ask me. Um, in line with uh, the recent videos I've done about, say, things like horror of acui and um, existential panic and room 101 and the worst thing in the world and that sort of thing. Um, I won't say that I've, I've sort of conceded that this state is as real as any value state can be, and as much as I've simply affirmed something that I've never really not felt. Um, horror of acui, I guess, or... Um, existential panic or the worst thing in the world simply can't be sort of just dismissed or poo-pooed or uh, denied. You have to deal with these things. You can't just say this is not a reasonable feeling, therefore I'm not going to feel this way. It doesn't work like that. Uh, reason and logic are useless against this sort of thing, or at least they're not as useful as one might think. They're not as as useful as, say, they might be in terms of a broken leg or something. There is a set step, set set of procedures um, that is to be followed in the event that a leg gets busted or something. When you're dealing with existential panic, you can't just get all reasonable and say, oh, it's just all in your head or whatever. Yeah, it is all in my head, but so is everything else, unfortunately. So, yes, it, it, I, I affirm that these are real value states, and they have to be dealt with. You can't just ignore them, and you can't just fix them quickly. Um, science doesn't seem to be up to the job, neither does pharmacology. I suppose one could pop a couple of Valium and suddenly feel a lot better, but that's... <laughs> That's a very, very uh, dangerous path to take, um, however many people do opt to take it. Um, no, I think that these things have to be worked out. Um, and I asked a question a couple of videos ago, rhetorically. Let's allow that the void and the state of existential horror are real. And they're not the sort of thing that you can just say, oh, never mind about that. Let's just say that it's real in terms of its impact on us as humans. Never mind that we can't physically describe the void or scientifically or logically or anything like this and that it can't really be scientifically dealt with either. Let's just allow that this is real. Is that all of reality? <laughs> that is kind of the... I won't say the way out for me, and I won't say that this is going to work for anybody. And I won't say that this is an easy path to follow, because it took me a, the better part of, I guess, 20 years to work this sort of way out in my mind. Um even though way out is a misleading term. <laughs> I said this was going to be esoteric. You start by accepting all of the ugliness and horrors of the world and your own inner life. You accept them all. Because uh, in, in my case, it was a forced acceptance. I understood that I couldn't defeat these demons, if we want to call them that because I didn't believe that these demons were defeatable. However, you go a little bit further. You have to... This requires some courage um, and humility, I guess. But you probe a little bit further. Yes, the pit of hell is there. Is that all that's there? Is reality itself thoroughly and 100% enveloped in that void? No, it's not. <laughs> um, because the, the, the ironic thing is, the refusal to accept the non-existence of the void 
is the same thing, the same kind of thinking that leads to the refusal of acceptance of the non-void. As I said, your uh, horror of AQI and existential panic are in many ways two completely opposite things, and yet they are intimately related with each other. In the same way as accepting the absolute realness of freedom, bliss, love, joy, all those sorts of things, as the ultimate reality is something of a lie, and you all, all I always had the feeling of telling myself a lie, or especially I believed that other people were lying to me when they told me that, you know, God is love, life is joy, uh, just never mind the, the, the negative things in life, keep on the sunny side of life, whatever. That to me always struck me as a gigantic lie, a dangerous lie. So is the view that the blackness and the darkness and the void is all that there is. It's also a dangerous lie. Um, as I said, I tend to see people like um, in Mendham as more or less just the mirror image or the alter ego of Ned Flanders. Um, and I can't say this enough, but I don't see negative uh, see in Mendham in the same negative light as a lot of people do. Uh, in that I sort of see him, I won't even say as a necessary evil, but a necessary voice that we would rather not hear. Um, the filth and the garbage and the terror and the blackness and the despair and all of that stuff is real, okay? And it does not behoove us to say otherwise. But by the same token, it doesn't behoove us in any way, shape, or form to say that that's all that there is, any more than it does us any good to say that all that there is is sunshine and lollipops. It's not a binary thing. And as I said before, our logic and our reason are not as useful as we might think in terms of reconciling uh, opposites or apparent opposites, because logic and reason, or at least the way that we employ them, are generally designed to rely upon opposites and falsifiability and um, non-contradiction and identity and things like that. My way out of existential panic and horror vacui and room 101 even, I guess, has been, in a way, and up here, to always endeavor, I won't say that one can always succeed at these sorts of things, but endeavor to keep, I won't even say a balance, but I would say in as much as this is possible, an integration of panic and calm, black and white, good and bad, horror, joy, peace, anxiety, that kind of thing, they're all real. It's the either-or business that I think messes us up in both ways. If Mendham is wrong, he's only wrong in the same way that Ned Flanders is wrong. 